Welcome to the secondary break. We're back. It's the off season. I'm Graham Bunn. If you are new to the show, which ironically enough, we have had some people added to the show. I uh, want to say welcome. We're basically just kind of a Carolina Tar Heel men's basketball recap show. And then with the portal, uh, I guess we kind of cover the off season because it's turning into pro basketball, which conversation for a different time. But I'm Graham Bunn, former Division One point guard, uh, massive Tar Heel fan. I got my brother-in-law, my, my my two guard on this little podcast recap show, Mr. Zach Talitsky, UNC alum, and uh, all around just amazing guy. So welcome back to the show, man. It's been a few weeks. Our other show did pretty well. Again, thank you to anybody and everybody that's watching it. I love doing this. This is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, and I convinced or coerced my, my partner here to even do it in the, in the off season. It was a tough sell during the season, but uh, I got him on here, man. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I guess it's it's good news that that we only have two new players to talk about and not an entirely new roster like some teams in college basketball. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and how those teams perform next year. Uh, yeah. But but I'm glad we've got uh, uh, the, the, the heart of the roster coming back. Yeah, we've got the core. And there's some things to talk about. Uh, uh, since we last discussed or uh, did a show, Van Allen Lubin, has joined the roster. So we've added a much needed piece and depth in, in the front court and, and all due respect to Zayden high and Jalen Washington and withers and all the guys that we have coming back. Like I, I think that doesn't change what they're capable of doing, but I think we needed some depth. And I think in order to run through a complete college basketball gauntlet, especially in the ACC, it's always good to have options. Iron sharpens iron. And from what I'm told, I've only seen highlights. I didn't watch a lot of Vanderbilt last year at all i might have caught some highlights uh i've been told that he is an impact player and someone that can come in and, and give us real minutes from day one yeah i mean he's a guy who who got real minutes at, at notre dame before transferring transferring to vandy um and then you know, played a year there um i know he's coming on strong late in the year at vandy and had some double doubles you know against ncaa tournament teams against florida against alabama who you know, we know have some tough uh, inside guys. And so, yeah. yeah, I think we're getting a proven, you know, two-year player at, you know, high major caliber. Um, those guys are hard to come by. Uh, in addition to that, you know, I assume we had some insight on him just in terms of the type of person and teammate and work ethic, you know, from Stackhouse and, mm -hmm. and maybe even from Cormac, because I think they overlapped uh, a year at Notre Dame. And so, all that's you know really positive, and hopefully he's flexible and can play both four and five, um, which I want to get into maybe a little bit later in the show. But I think this yeah. roster, the way it looks to be constructed, you know, is going to give Hubert a lot of pieces that I think he can mix and match um, depending on the opponent and how people are playing. It's going to be really interesting to see how the rotation works out with this with this roster. Yeah, I'm glad that you touched on that because I think it's a very underrated piece and something that I feel Carolina has always hung its hat on, especially during the Dean Smith era. I, I think Roy carried this torch as well, and Hubert is continuing to make choices with the roster that reflect character. And, you know, not to not to point fingers or kick dirt on anybody that has been in the program and left the program, but he always talks about character and Hubert's always hanging his hat on being a family guy and taking care of the locker room as if it was family. And so when you mention the the insight into his character, because we've got his former coach and a former teammate giving valuable feedback that are essential parts of the Carolina family in Jerry Stackhouse and Cormac Ryan, I, I don't think a lot of people are talking about what's a nice thing that is for us like what a luxury it is to get that kind of scouting report from not only a coach but also a former teammate because those are two different uh point of views and we went ahead and signed him so i think that bodes well for the locker room uh like you said rosters are turning over more so than they've ever done before so chemistry is going to be more challenging to build than it's ever been before and so when you get a high character guy as much as you want them to be amazing on the floor i do think we've had several incredible players that maybe they just didn't mesh well and the chemistry was off and it was detrimental to the team's success. So awesome point, best point of the day so far. I think just getting the, the character reference from other guys is huge. And it's, it's gone, I think under the radar a little bit because I haven't really heard a lot of people talk about that. 
Yeah, I mean, we went from being out of the tournament to a number one seed in back-to-back years, and I don't know that the talent level of those teams was was really all that different. Mm-hmm. I mean, from the outside looking point. in, um, yeah. you know, what was different to me was just how much fun they had playing together last year and, mm-hmm. you know, the joy that they brought, and, and you felt it as a fan. And, you know, what? as a fan, I would much rather watch that team too, right? Oh, like, yeah. I mean, we used to yeah. talk about it all the time during last year's season, just like, how easy it was to root for those guys and just, you know, I, I'd, I'd end up every game, you know, just with a big smile on my face just because they were playing with so much joy. And, you know, we're going to miss that with, with Harrison because I think he's a major piece of that. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, hopefully, um, you know, hopefully we've got enough senior leadership uh, coming back that they can impart that over the summer and Hubert can, uh, can do the same, uh, but that's got to be player led. Right. And so bringing in the right pieces, um, is probably, you know, as important, if not more important than bringing in the most talented pieces, particularly Agreed. with what we've got coming back. Agreed. I, I mean, I think you can make a very strong case for just the the Brady Manic addition. And I'm drawing a blank on the young man's name. Not a bad kid from what I know. I don't know anything about him character-wise, but he ended up leaving the team, went back to Minnesota. Dar- Garson Garcia or Dawson Garcia? Yeah. So obviously an incredibly talented player uh, and he was splitting minutes and, you know, kind of him and Brady are in and out of the lineup. He ends up taking leave for a family issue and, and you know, obviously prayers up and, and you want nothing but good things for him and his family. But the chemistry on the team seemed to change and they went on that massive run. Now, I'm an outsider. I don't know exactly why that is, but to me, just to echo your point, it seemed like chemistry changed within that team for that run. And I think Brady Manic is celebrated as one of Carolina's like most favorite players in recent memory, just because of once he got the opportunity to be a full-time starter and logging 35 plus minutes a game and the iron five and all of that, what they were able to accomplish. People seem to, and all the reports coming out of the locker room were everybody loved him. Everybody loved Brady Maddock. And I think that translated to the team's success. So I'm with it. I love the character reference. I love everything that I'm hearing about uh, Lubin. And hopefully, just to add to your point, he is able to play multiple positions. I'd love to get into that. I mean, you you seem to have a, a point that you wanted to discuss there. What are you thinking? Yeah, I was just thinking about the roster and thinking about the number of guys that we have that I think can flex between, you know, at least two spots, uh, yeah. if not more. Agreed. I mean, obviously RJ can, can flex and play one or two. I mean, mm-hmm. I think we saw last year, we'd much rather have them playing at, at, at two. Yeah. Um, I think Trimble can play one or two. Correct. Um, I don't really know um, uh, Ines Jackson's game well enough to know, but yeah, you, you, I figured he can play two and three. I don't think we're going to have oh. him initiating offense, but I think, he can play either of those those uh, wing spots. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the same for um, oh, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, Drake Powell. Other, yeah, Drake Powell. I yep. think he can play two or three. Whether he can play four or not, I don't know. I think is an open question. Yeah. And then I think Cade Tyson probably can play three or four. Correct. Um, I, I would hope so. I don't know. You know, obviously defensively, you you kind of learn. It's going to be yeah. a little bit different. Guys, he's going to be guarding will be bigger, stronger, faster. But offensively, for sure, he can plug and play. He can play both those spots, especially in Hubert's four round one offense. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Withers played some three and four last year. Um, mm-hmm. I thought he was more effective at the four, but certainly I think he he could log some minutes at three if you needed. Yeah, I think Zayden High hopefully can play four and five. Um, Lubin hopefully can play four and five, and and, and Jalen can probably play four and five. Um, mm-hmm. And so, uh, I. You know, I, I think that that it's both an opportunity and a challenge, you know, for Hubert. You know, on on, um, on some nights you could see him going small, you know, and yeah. going really perimeter oriented and, and put a lot of shooting on the floor, you know, and then other games maybe we need to go bigger. You know, if we play Clemson next year, if P.J. comes back, I don't know if he will, but, you know, they're going to probably play two bigs regardless you know, do we with Lubin? You know, now could we go? You know, Jalen and Lubin and go bigger um, and match up with those types of teams. Um, and so I think that that type of flexibility uh, is a great option for the coach, but it puts I think a lot more of a challenge 
in front of them to figure out like, how do you get those roles established? How do you get everybody showing up to the gym, knowing what they're supposed to be doing and contributing to the team? And if there's a lot of flexibility from night to night on, you know, what that looks like, you know, people have to be able to, to adjust. Um, so I think it's going to be interesting. That's a lot different than a team where, you know, you've got five or six guys, they've got very, very specific positions that they can play. And, um, you know, you're not really flexing all that much based on the matchup. Yeah, uh, I'm 99.9% sure P.J. Hall is not coming back to Clemson. Uh, okay, that, that bad that example then. Passed. Yeah, no, no, but I wanted to bring it up because uh, yeah. that is, that's a front court that we would have to go big with, and I was fearful of it. And part of the reason that I wanted to do this show was because I do feel like and I feel like a bad fan saying this, that we're one piece away from really contending roster-wise for a national title. I do feel like the way that Arkansas, Baylor, UConn, Kansas, and uh, Alabama, how their rosters are structured as is sits today, that we are a little bit on a tier beneath them as far as depth and talent uh, when it comes to front court. So, you know, P.J. Hall unbelievable college player. I, I wish the best for him in the NBA draft. I wish the best for Harrison Ingram, especially. I really hope that, you know, they're, they're projecting as high as 25. I hope he goes 25. I hope he goes 20 and uh, achieves all of his dreams, but I'm with you. I, I, I think there's going to be some bigger teams where we're going to need to go big, but I also feel like, you know, there's going to be some games where we'll see Trimble at the three. You know, I, I see a three guard offense with the way Hubert likes to get the ball, you know, up and down the court pressure out. And then, you know, team gang rebound and then get out on the break. So I'm with you as far as I love and am excited about the way most of the roster can flex. I, you know, I think Elliot's pretty much the only one that's landlocked into one position. Yeah. Agreed. And and I'd love to see us play small ball sometimes next year and press agreed. and really get out and run. You know, you could agreed. imagine like an Elliot RJ, you know, Ian Jackson or, or uh, Trimble, you know, maybe put Powell, you know, or somebody like that or Withers at four and then uh, Lubin at five. You know, it's it's not a super tall lineup, but you could imagine those guys like really being active defensively, you know, getting into passing lanes, you know, pressing, um, just getting up and down. I, and, and again, I think, you know, it'd be it's going to be interesting to see what style uh, Hubert wants to play and then like what adjustments he, he makes. Um, similarly at five, right? Like, I don't know if we have anybody on this roster unless we add another piece that we're just going to throw the ball into the post, you know, every time right. down as our no. primary offense. Now that doesn't mean Washington can't be really effective offensively. I think he can, but I think he's going to be much more of a pick and pop guy. You know, mm -hmm. we, he probably should get the ball a little bit more in the mid post, um, where he can face and, and have a little bit of space. Um, but, you know, that remains to be seen. And 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 um, I don't think we really know exactly how Hubert's going to incorporate him if he is our starting five. Yeah, can you remember? And I tried to think back, and I could not remember. Uh, and I didn't have the time to go through my DVR and watch all the games, even though I love doing that. Do you remember how much success we had when Washington and Baycott were on the floor together? Because for predominantly he was, he was Baycott's you know, come in, rest you for two, three minute stint, and that and that's it. But there were a few games, and I can't remember which ones where they were on the floor together. And I'm just drawing a blank because I, I'd love to get a small minor picture of what Hubert might be seeing, and maybe he's doing that in practice. And you know, I, I keep overlooking Zayden High, and I, I do not mean to. I don't I just haven't seen Zayden High play a lot. You know what I mean? So I don't know what he's capable of. Hopefully he's crushing it in practice and and one of the reasons there's rumors that we're done recruiting is because Zayden High's development is just going through the roof. That that would be great news. Um, I, I can't confirm that because obviously we're not in practice and we're not in summer runs. So I don't know. As it stands, I feel like we need another piece as far as stretch four or maybe the Onyenso kid at five. Yeah, I would lean towards the Onyenso just from a defensive perspective. Um, I mean, it would not shock me if if – yeah, you know, Jalen Washington's a better offensive player than Onyenso is at this at this point. Oh, um, non-debatable, non-debatable. Uh, yeah, but but you know, like that length and that size. You know, there's certain games, certain matchups. You know, I know Edie's gone and and Klingon are gone, but I mean, 
I would not really want to roll into a final four game, you know, with the right. rosters as constructed, having to face one of those two guys. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not taking anything away from the, the post guys we have coming back. It's just, those are tough matchups unless you have yeah. that bully, that bully down low. Um, or so, a you know, that, or yeah, I just put their face in the room. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, you know, we're, we're maybe missing that type of player, that real mm-hmm. physical dominant, uh, low, low post defender. Um, you know, a bit of luxury. Everybody wants one of those guys. There aren't many to go around. Um, but that would be the piece to me that, that this roster, you know, if, if I could add one thing that that's what it would be. So we have two open slots, correct. And I don't think we're going to fill so. both. Uh, no, you know, there like are, it. yeah, there are rumors that we're not filling either. And maybe, you know, that goes to a walk-ons and, and I support that Hubert knows better than I do. And he's in practice and he sees, you know, the summer workouts and see how kids are developing. So this is all speculation, but let's just say for conversation, barbershop talk, that we're going to fill one out of the two. Now, the two names that have been heavily circulated and that we've been linked to, uh, an article came out the other day that, you know, we were one of two landing spots for Coleman Hawkins, the 6'10". He's a power forward or he's a he's actually a, a really tall, small forward the way he plays, but people are saying he's going to play center for us. I don't see that at all, uh, but he did play a little bit of center for Illinois. Very talented guy. There are some character issues that have been surfacing about him that I that kind of worry me just because you and I just talked about the chemistry thing. I want I, I loved pulling for our team so much because I felt like our chemistry was great and I don't want to mess that up. And then there's the Onyenso seven footer that you know can play above the rim, can really clean the glass, more of a defensive presence. Of those two, which would you prefer of those two players? For me it's easily Onyenso. Um, simply because I think Coleman Hawkins and what he would bring is a little bit redundant to the roster. Um, It's a little bit redundant to what Jalen brings and probably a little bit what Lubin brings. Um, And uh, I I just think that the the piece to me that this roster needs the most is that defensive presence. And I just don't think he, um, I'm not saying he's not a good defender, but, but against sure. a big five, you know, he's just, oh, yeah. he's, he's, he doesn't have a physical presence. And, and look, like we were watching the game together, that Illinois Connecticut game. Um, you know, he just really wasn't able to do anything with Klingon, yeah, uh, and, and sort of was immediately taken out of that game. And so, um, you know, that, that's sort of fresh, fresh in my memory about him, which is maybe like an unfair, uh, sure. evaluation, but, uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, I think, to me, Onyenso, you know, he really only has one year at Kentucky. You know, I could see huge growth and development going into his second year um, and just adds like a whole nother dimension to this team. And against in certain matchups, again, we're going to need that that five rim protector. And I think he's probably the best one available. Yeah, there's rumors that he's going to be on campus this week, but he's also got a scheduled visit to Kansas State. Now, I can't confirm either one of those, but I, I've been told by sources close to the program that uh, those are the two visits that he does have scheduled. Again, I wish I could confirm it. I, I can't, but the, those are the, I wouldn't say heavily reliable, but the most reliable rumors that I have access to is that he is going to be on campus. So when I hear that we're done recruiting, it's like, well, what about this visit that Onyenso has got scheduled? And then, you know, we keep getting linked to Coleman Hawkins. Of the two of those guys, I, I honestly, and I know that you and I have talked about it, uh, Trayvon Brazil out of Arkansas, he's like 6'10". I think he's a hybrid of both Onyenso and Hawkins without, you know, Hawkins has some some character stuff that's come out about him throughout the draft process. And some of the interviews he did, I think, rubbed some programs the wrong way. I don't know him, so it, it's tough for me to come on, and, and I definitely won't attack anyone's character that I do not know. But Brazil doesn't seem to have any of those. Now, he's had some injury problems, but he's 6'10", jump shot, and can fly. So yeah, crazy athletic. Crazy athletic. Yeah. And so for our system and what we have, I feel like he's a hybrid of both of those guys. Now, I don't know how dedicated he is to the, the defensive side of the ball, but if you want to play and you're on the roster at Carolina, Hubert's going to make you play defense. And that guy's got every tool in the book to guard three, four, and five. So, yeah, and not- he can move his feet too. Like, like yeah. I mean, he, he can, he can switch. And, you know, people, you know, they sleep on what Baycott did last year in terms of, you know, ball screens and moving Man. his feet and staying in front of guards. But he got to be quite, quite good at that. 
Yes. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll miss that on the defensive end if our five can't, uh, mm-hmm. can't replicate what he was able to do. And I worry about Jalen Washington's ability to guard the high pick and roll when it's in the middle of the court. So yeah. on, on one side, you can shade and heavily force and encourage the ball handler. You take away one side, but when it's at the top and you, you've seen the success that Elliot has, like Elliot and RJ both, high pick and roll in the middle of the floor is like pick your poison. Those guys, mm-hmm. you know, usually Elliot gets downhill and finds somebody or he gets to the rim. RJ's like, oh, if you go under, I'm going to shoot it. If you go over top, I'm going to hit the runner. And if you double, I'm going to dump it down to the roller for a dunk. Like it's literally that checklist. And so I worry about our ability to defend that because I think that a lot of the better teams, especially Baylor, a lot of KU with Hunter Dickinson who can pick and pop and roll. Uh, I feel like they run that a lot. So if we're going to have success in March, I feel like we need to have somebody that's going to be able to defend that that offensive set. Yeah, I mean, it's such a staple now throughout college basketball where, you know, the good teams with the good guards, they're going to, you know, work the pick and roll to get a switch, and then they're going to hunt that that four or five that they think can't move their feet and stay in front. And so, you know, you know it's coming, and it's going to come a lot. And, um, you know, the best teams have great guards and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's just such a luxury if you've got a, a, a five that can uh, defend that or at least make it, make it tough on those guards. So yeah, that's going to be, that's going to be the interesting spot. Um, you know, the rest of the rest of the roster seems stacked and uh, you know, part of me, loves the idea of saying let's just let Jalen and Zayden develop. Of course. Of I mean, course. That's the way it's always been my entire lifetime, right? Is yeah. you you play a year or two, you wait, you know, you're in practice every day, mm-hmm. and you come back that summer, you know, when you know you're gonna get elevated to the starting position and you're, you know, you're you're putting in the work in the weight room, um, in the gym. And, you know, over our lifetime being Carolina fans, you see people make make those jumps and it's yeah. fun as a fan, right? Like yeah, you, you watch them the first time. I mean, I, I we may have talked about this before, but there's so many guys. I remember Roy would give them playing time their freshman year. I'm like, what is that person doing on the floor? Luke May. Luke May. I was like, Luke what May. is he doing? And then, mm-hmm. you know, junior year, senior year, um, you know, yeah, you're, you're thinking, why are you ever taking that person off the floor? Right. Um, and so, you know, that that to me is is a great part of college basketball and a great part of being a college basketball fan. And, mm-hmm. you know, you like to reward the guys that committed to the program out of high school who wanted mm-hmm. to be here, who have stayed when they could have left. I mean, both of those guys could have transferred out yeah. and they stuck around. And so, you know, part of me selfishly would say, oh, I'd love to have another piece just because it gives us more talent and more options. But at the same time, if 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 uh, you know we're watching these guys in practice and they're making great strides and they make the call that yeah this is the team we're rolling with, hey, I'm, I'm okay yeah. being maybe slightly less talented, but rewarding that kind of loyalty and you know assuming they're working hard, right? If they're not, yeah, if they're not doing the work, then of course you you know you gotta go find somebody who will. But I'm assuming they right. both are. So um, you know I'm excited to see the jump that 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 those guys make. Yeah, I'm I'm in the position, and and last year really changed things or solidified things for me with Hubert and the staff. In that I trust what they see, and I trust their appraisal of the situation. My only point or pushback to that is Zayden High is going to be a sophomore, and you know I'll, I'll put it in in quarterback terms. Like sometimes it, it's well documented, guys got the the world of potential, and they throw him in as a starter. Peyton Manning starts his his first year and throws a league high interception after interception because he doesn't have the luxury of developing underneath a veteran and so nowadays you know a lot of rookies are playing but like the luxury of developing someone Aaron Rodgers under under Brett Favre for a few years makes them better and allows them to have a longer career because they're not thrown into the tides and the rough waters before they know how to swim and so on the same side, if Hubert is watching these workouts and watching pickup and Zayden High is just not there yet, then I, I'm i all for bringing in Brazil. Hawkins scares me because of the chemistry thing. You know, I'm a little bit worried about it. I don't know him, so I can't say good or bad, but, like, there's a lot of articles out there about, hey, I want this much money, and and I get it. It's a business decision, and, um, you know, it's it's 
pretty well documented that there's there's some things there uh, that have scared off other programs or on Yenso. But if Zayden High is not not quite ready yet, I would love to see him develop another year and not get thrown into the fire and then waste that opportunity. So let's say he performs poorly and he says, well, I'm not an ACC player and he leaves instead of developing one more year. And as a junior, which is, you know, you still have two years of meaningful playing time and meaningful minutes to be a contributor on a national powerhouse. Yeah. Do you think um, we're paying market rates for NIL? No. I don't think we are either. No. It's it's hard because NIL is so new, and I think it's negating the tradition and, you know, the allure of a blue blood program. And so maybe we haven't figured out a way to value what Carolina means in addition to NIL. It's like buying an airplane ticket when you have cash and miles. Like it's, it's a scale. Carolina definitely means something, but NIL makes it mean a little bit less to a lot of these kids who are like, uh, you know, this is a business decision. I, I, someone's going to pay me 2 million. I got to go. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I don't, and I don't know if we're not paying market rates because, you know, the fans haven't ponied up and we don't have the same sort of collective that uh, right. some of these other schools have. And so it just sort of speaks to the importance to the athletic program or we're not paying market rates because Hubert doesn't believe in it. And he doesn't, he's not looking for guys just to come in and be mercenaries. And that's not right. to say we're not paying these guys anything. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that, that we are, but, um, but maybe it's it, in his mind, it needs to be a little bit more of a balance. And so you need to be here for the right reasons. And, um, and yeah, you know, we're going to try to put together an NIL package for you, but if you're going to just go to the highest bidder, like we're not going to win. Right. Um, and, and I don't know if any of that's right. And that just may be, maybe me making up excuses for us, you know, losing some mm-hmm. of our top targets on the board, you know, when the, and I, when the transfer season started. So maybe I'm just making excuses but something tells me we're not as um, yeah active or yeah, uh, paying, paying top, top dollar for these guys. But I don't know. Yeah, I think it's it definitely we could do an entire show on NIL. And, and something came out the other day where they're going to put a salary cap on it. So, you know, it's just like Major League Baseball, you know, the whole money ball thing with Oakland's payroll and the Yankees payroll. And it's hard to compete. And especially someone like me that that went to Appalachian State or Bowling Green, one of these mid-majors that don't have the resources to compete with some of these bigger brands in college basketball. I'm all for the salary cap. I think it was like $20 million per team. And uh, I did see where former players were available for back pay. And unfortunately, I, I, I'm, I'm too far back. I reached out to both my coaches. Hey, I expect a check in the mail. I, I, I'd like a check. They're like, yeah, bro. Yeah, I'll send you a, a soda and a bag of chips. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think that we are. But, again, I don't have any information to go on. But it does not seem as if we're we're dishing out $2 million offers. I would imagine R.J. Davis is getting a healthy bag. But even RJ, like, you know, you hear about the kid at Washington making $2 million and you hear about uh, Nor- uh, Norchad O'Meara making one point five, and the Rutgers kids getting a $2 million offer. Didn't really hear anything about what RJ got. And maybe it's because they kept it in-house and they didn't want it to get out. But yeah. I just don't, I don't think he's getting $2 million. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know either. I mean, um, you know, he and Baycott were getting like national TV ads during the NCAA tournament, and um, yeah, yeah. So clearly, the the brand does matter, and and the exposure matters, yeah, and yeah. being on a good team matters, being a number one seed matters. Um, but yeah, and, and and maybe we're just prioritizing the money we do have on our existing roster, you know, more so than bringing guys in from the outside, and I'm okay with that too. Mm-hmm. Also, don't know to what extent. Um, just the discrepancy in income between the ACC and the SEC and the Big Ten is starting to show up now. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, when you look at, you know, how aggressive a lot of these SEC teams, you know, have been, um, you know, some of it is obviously the draw of Calipari and getting a chance to play for him and and all that. But, um, you know, all the other SEC teams also feel like um, you've been throwing I don't know what they're throwing around, but but they've been very aggressive and gotten you know a large percentage. It seems like of the the, the big name portal guys. So, mm-hmm. I, I you know that's just going to continue to filter through. Um, you know between the combination of 
was it's going to grow, grow to be 30, 40 million dollars annually in, in um, TV rights between those two conferences and everyone else. I mean, that's going to have to trickle down and have an impact on you know, the size of the NIL unless the, the donor base is just willing to step in and make up that gap. And that's just not sustainable. Um, so I don't know. I feel like if we end, I mean, I, I, I'm an ACC guy. I, I, I wish that, that there was a path forward where we could remain in the ACC and remain competitive on the national landscape. But something tells me that those days are, are quickly coming to an end. Yeah, agreed. I mean, it's hard to compete with with Calipari. He had a nice NIL deal package back in 08 over at Memphis. So <laughs> he was just he was just ahead of his time. Hey man, he's had a he's had about a decade head start on everybody else with this uh with this NIL stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, again, if you had to go one through ten, and we'll we'll wrap this up here in the next couple minutes. But if you had to say one through ten, do you think that we're done? Do you think the roster changes at all before tip off? Do we add one more piece? Uh, one to ten, ten being we're definitely adding. One being nah, we're we're not adding anybody. I would say seven. Uh, we're adding. Oh, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. Uh, but I think it's I think it's going to be selective. Like I don't think I, and. And I don't know, like maybe I, I, I'm, um, what was this, the guys from West Virginia um, who's since left, a, con, a Conquo or something? Yeah, a Conquo. Yeah. Um, it could be a piece like that, that that maybe, you know, look, if you've got an extra roster spot, like, um, you know, mm-hmm. practice player, you know, a little bit of size, athleticism, you know, just. Um, but when I when I'm saying like add one more piece, it's really like more of like a substantial like could be starter get you know twenty plus minutes a game type of piece. Yeah. So the five names, you know, Jameer Watkins from Florida State. I don't know where he's been linked to. I haven't seen more anything. of a wing though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Hawkins, Anyenso, Kaluma, who I, I think we got no shot at, which I don't think he fits yeah. what, we're, what we want to do, yeah. and then in Brazil. So Brazil or or. I mean, so I, I know every, I mean, either one of those, I'd be ecstatic. I'd be ecstatic. Yeah. But Brazil, for some reason, and I caught a few games and just saw the, the upside to what this kid is capable of doing. And again, he, he's had some injury issues. I think he started at Missouri, but his size length athleticism and the ability, oh man, he can do it all. And we, I feel like he can. I believe in Hubert's ability to mold guys into a system. And so I think that that's a piece that is very, I mean, he, he offers a lot. It's not like he can only do one thing. He can do almost everything. Yeah. I mean, like the style of play that you could imagine with that team would be so much fun as a plant, as a fan, right? You know, Hubert's going to have them locked in on defense. So we're going to turn the ball over. We're going to get out and run. Mm-hmm. And all, you know, that entire team is going to be able to get up and down. I mean, there's going to be, you know, so many lob dunks, you know. Well, he'd be the only, team. he'd be the only lob guy. So like he would get all of those. He'd be yeah. in the dunker spot. And if they collapse to the rim, he would just flare out to the corner for threes. And like uh, Mark Sears at Bama is a scoring point guard. He's going to get shots up. He's an incredible player, probably preseason on a lot of lists, national player of the year along with RJ. But our point guard is pass first. So that's 20% of the roster there. That's not going to be taking a lot of shots. So if I'm him, I'm like, okay, well, here's one backcourt that's a pass first guy. Here's another guy that's going to be preseason national player of the year on most people's list that's going to be getting doubled. So there's going to be open looks for me that I don't have to create for myself. That's going to, you know, I'm going to get six to eight free points without even trying, just knocking down open looks in transition from those two guards. It just seems like it would be a very attractive place to play on top of big brand, national TV, chance to have success. You're going to make some money. And, uh, you know, I just, with what Arkansas has done with their roster, I don't know if he wants to go back to that roster with a new coach. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and you know, chance of making a run in the Final Four with us. I mean, you know, I think with him on the roster, I mean, I don't think that's unrealistic expectations for that team. Agreed, agreed. So I'm, I'm on the Brazil train. I know that it, it's a, it's a long shot. I think Onyenso is probably the, 
the highest bet. If you were going to place a bet, I think that we're in the mix for him, and I think he's the highest bet. Yeah, I think both would be great. Um, maybe maybe short of getting one of those two, then, then maybe we, we just stand pat. Mm -hmm. All right. Give me as is, and I think you did this already, but I forgot. I'd love to. I'd love to get your starting five. Well, no, no. Since we, you know, we haven't done this since we have Lubin. Give me your starting five right now. I guess it's going to be. I guess it's going to be uh, Elliot and RJ. And mm -hmm. um, you think they're going to start Cade? So th 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 this is this is the conversation because you know the Cade or, or kid. You could start Cade at three as well. Yeah. Van Lubin and Washington, if you if you wanted size. I think Ian starts. I just don't know if he starts day one. I think it's just a matter of time until he starts. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's going to be interesting. Obviously, they're gonna to have to battle it out over the summer and in and, and, mm -hmm. and camp. Um, I mean, having having Cade come off the bench and and provide some shooting and some scoring punch, maybe with the with a second roster could be interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think, again, these are, I think the types of rotations Hubert's going to really have to figure out is like which pieces work best coming off the bench. Um, and yeah. then I think it's probably going to be, um, Lubin at four and Washington at five. Okay. Um, but, but maybe that's not what they have in mind for Lubin. I mean, maybe they view him as, as a backup five behind, behind Washington. I'm not sure. So as it sits today without seeing summer workouts, um, I would love to see just because one, I'm a shooter and I, I really value shooting. And I feel like when we shoot the ball well, because we were a good defensive team, I think Hubert stresses that and takes care of it. So when we shoot well, I feel like we win games. Uh, I feel like our, our defense is pretty consistent. Um, I would go Elliot, RJ, Ian, Cade, Washington. You know, it's kind of small, but what Cade yeah. six, seven, right? So we, we have, yeah. we're undersized at the four and I get that, but offensively, both four and five can step out to three, you know, like in that lineup, our point guards, our worst three point shooter. Yeah. I, I mean, I feel like that lineup we have to experiment with at some point, you know, whether it works or not, not, I don't know, Yeah, but that lineup would be awesome. I mean, it'd be so much fun to watch those guys. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I, I wouldn't mind, you know, having, um, yeah, I mean, just to have five shooters on the floor like that, you know, especially with Cadeau, you know, and Cadeau basically driving and kicking to everybody with that space. I mean, that that would yeah. be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm I'm with it. I want to see it. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 we might exp experiment with uh, Drake playing a little bit of four too, which you know, from a from a perimeter defensive perspective, and we could we could probably lock some people down. Yeah, I just saw an article where he was ranked the number one defender in this class. Yeah. So, you know, I think he's versatile. So, I, you know, and and he has a knack for it. But uh, I, I do believe we're going to see him in multiple positions. And kind of def depending on his development in preseason workouts, which way they're going to lead. Like, hey, we want to add some muscle and, and, and really have you maybe venture into the four, dip a toe if you can. Or – Hey, we're just going to keep working on your mobility and flexibility and work on your range and, you know, offensive one, two bounce counter moves and, and keep you on the perimeter. So offensively, we're just really tough to guard. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what they do with that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we ended up coming around on the perimeter defense um, over the course of the year, but uh, you know, especially at the beginning of the year, we really miss Leakey. And so I'm hoping that he can come in and play that role and maybe even be more of a gifted offensive player. Um, than, than Leakey was. Um, yeah. But but having that type of athlete, you know, that you can bring in if, if somebody gets hot, you know, I mean, we mm -hmm. we certainly did it with Seth uh, a couple times last year. He did an incredible job on uh, Carrington and the, the ACC. Oh, yeah. Down yeah. In the second half. But, you know, Seth doesn't have the size or the length. And so like a bigger wing, you know, a lot of times we wouldn't have an answer for if they like started going off on us. And so, you know, I could mm -hmm. see him getting big minutes in that role. Yeah, Grant Two, Nelson. Yeah, yeah. But that's why um, I want. That's why I want the the Brazil kid. That's what yeah, I like you know, yeah. six ten, long, can move his feet, and, and I, it's just it's tough. And for anyone that's watching this, this this is the only thing I'll, I'll say about myself. Uh, I'm very very lucky and very blessed to play in a pro run here in Los Angeles. Uh, the guy Gafford that is in the NBA Finals for the Mavericks. He's a seven footer. He and Nick Claxton, uh, he was the center for the Brooklyn Nets, also 6'10", long, skinny, built like Played Brazil. Played in Georgia, yeah. Yeah. They play in this run. 
uh, in the summers when, when they're in the offseason. It completely changes what you're able to do offensively in a half-court set. You can't get anywhere near the rim unless you're Kyrie Irving and you just can finish. It, it just They erase so many mistakes. So Brazil at 6'10", w- when I tell you that it just changes the dynamic of what other teams are able to do offensively against us with him on the floor as like maybe the three or four, like I, you know, it's been several years since I played at in college or played overseas in Europe, and even in Europe, they didn't have the size that that most power fives have now. But it, it's just such a weapon when you can kind of erase certain mistakes when you have length like that. And he's you know six ten, and I can't imagine what his wingspan is. And if he's playing the three, uh, like it, I, I I would put our roster with that kid against. Baylor, Bama, Kansas, which I think Kansas is going to be preseason number one. Bama is going to be preseason number one. One of those two, uh, I think, will be as as we stand now, maybe six or seven. But I think we get that kid worth three or four. Yeah, and we have to deal with Cooper Flag too. Uh, and Problem. so, you know, we're going to need somebody who's pretty athletic and bouncy to to slow him down. Yeah, I mean, right now I, I'm with you. I think they end up putting Drake on him. Like yeah. I, I, I think he's one of the only guys. Yeah, I mean, I don't think Cade can move with him. Um, yeah. So I think I think Drake's going to end up having to to take on that assignment as the primary defender for a lot of that game. Now, whether he starts that game or not, who knows? But you know, but if if Brazil was there, we put him on. We, like, Here you go. You know, f- deal with that. Somebody needs to send this to Brazil. Let him know how much we need him and uh, tell him to come on down. I don't think he's very active because I trust me, I'm not above it. Uh, if we ever get Joel Barry on here, he'll tell you a story about me sending him uh, tweets when he was like a sophomore in high school. Like, hey, man, we'd love to see you in Carolina blue. We still joke about that. He was like, bro, <laughs> do you know I was getting messages? Because he started following me immediately. I mean, he was like, what, 15? Uh, I was like, well, this, this guy, he thinks I should play at Carolina as a sophomore. <laughs> and he ended up coming, and now we're, we're now we're buddies. But he's always like, yeah, man, you – you were you were early. <laughs> he was like, I don't even know if I was getting letters yet. <laughs> oh man! All right, bro. Uh, I love doing these things, man. Thank you so much for making time. I know that you're going to be out of pocket for a little while, and and hopefully we're going to make a roster change. And when you get back, maybe we'll we'll do an updated uh, Carolina secondary break. You know what I mean? That'd be fun, and and maybe we can uh, somehow get Kenny to come back on and and give us some insight into the summer summer games. I don't know if he's allowed to discuss, but it'd be great to to hear how the team's progressing. Yeah. When you reach out to me, I reached out to him. He confirmed that he would. So there we go. Gonna, All right. We'll get, All right. We'll get him on uh, when you get back. So I think you're going to be gone for a couple of weeks. Right. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. figure something out when you get back and we'll get Kenny on here and the three of us chop it up. I would love to hear what he says about some of these runs and, and how these guys look, especially like, look, RJ, I know everyone's say, oh, RJ's going to be good. And I, I think he's going to be, uh, he's going to have a good year. He's going to have a great year. I don't know if he can replicate what he did last year because it was just, he was just incredible. Like just the accuracy. Hopefully he does. But like what part of his game can he expound upon? I mean, his floater was lethal. His, his, you know, the depth of shot that he was able to make, unbelievable. The step backs, unbelievable. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing things like what RJ is going to be better at. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't, place my finger on that yeah yeah I, I agree and um yeah i don't know what kind of um leader rj is i don't i don't know his makeup he strikes me as is a, a very good leader and somebody that's going to drive the team all summer uh to mm-hmm. be great um yeah. so i'd be curious just to hear like what his mentality is over the summer and like what kind of impact he has on the young guys and, and i've heard him say several times you know, when he and Caleb came in, there there really weren't upperclassmen to show them the Carolina way. Right. And I just think it's such a huge benefit uh, to Ian and Drake to be able to come in and um, and uh, have that type of role model. And obviously, Cadeau's got a year under his belt and, you know, has had to learn. So, um, yeah, I think that's going to be uh, huge for their, their development over the summer because they're going to know what the standard is and, like, what it mm-hmm. takes to – uh, you know, put in the work to be successful. Yeah, one of the things, and I, I don't know this, but this would be my guess, and I'd love to ask Kenny about it. I got a chance to play with a guy at Bowling Green named Keith McLeod, and he ended up playing, I think he was 10-year NBA career, just unreal. Uh, 
Mac Player of the Year. He's the all-time leading scorer. He or he was when he when he left. It, it might have been broken. There's a kid in the 76ers that had an incredible career at BG as well. But he was really quiet. RJ strikes me as a quiet kid. But Keith was always like pushing his PR records in the weight room. He was always getting up an extra 500 shots. And I, I I really pride myself on work ethic. I wasn't the most talented kid by any means, but I was a gym rat and I didn't mind practicing. I didn't, you know, I wasn't cool enough to do other stuff. So I was in the gym all the time. Well, Keith was in the gym. He was the most talented player. He was the best player and he outworked everybody, myself included. And it always made me want to figure out different ways to, to be better. And I feel like RJ's that way. Like he might not be the rah rah guy and that's getting in people's faces or pulling guys or making people like, hey, you better be in the gym. But when your best player is your hardest worker, it trickles down a lot. And teams, I think, benefit from that. And so I, I think that we have a unique opportunity this year, which we might not have for a while. Or we have, uh, I mean, definitely not going to have a guy that plays all five years, but a senior, let alone a super senior, that's your best player. And National player of the year, but has the the best work ethic. So I really hope that we maximize it. That maybe that doesn't turn into a national championship. But if we don't make the final four, I, I'll be I'll be disappointed for RJ because he lost in the title game. He makes the, the decision to come back and play a fifth year, which sometimes people are like, "Well, yeah, it's just college." Well, I played five years in college, and and that fifth year was challenging at times because you're like, "Man, I've just been doing this over and over and over and over for half a decade." It's a lot. So I'm I'm hopeful for, for him that he's rewarded by coming back. Yeah, I agree. And I also think Cadeau is going to be working his tail off this summer. I think, mm-hmm. you know, his comments after we lost Alabama about, you know, because he didn't play as much. Heart attack. Half heart, is, heart attack for me. Me too. I thought he was leaving. <laughs> yeah, was but like, he's, 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 like, I, he's like, I've got to make it impossible to keep me off the floor. And, yeah. you know, and look, I think he's a guy that, that, that clearly has, you know, NBA aspirations, you know, yeah. given where he's ranked coming in. And, and, and he, he, he classed up. And so I think people are, you know, sometimes probably judging him a little bit unfairly. There's been a lot of point guards who've classed up who, um, did not play nearly as well as he did last year. It's just incredibly hard to do. Yeah. And I think, I think, you know, he's going to put in the work this summer and, and, um, and I don't, you know, I just don't think his shot has that far. It has to come like, you know, it's not one of those shots. It's just it like got totally better. broken. It and got so, better. And so I, th- I think over the course of the summer, you know, he's going to, he's going to transform his game too. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and so I think between the two of them, I, I, I think they're, they're just going to drive this team forward over the summer, but I'd love to hear Kenny's inside view of just how people have, have grown and developed and, you know, who's become the vocal leader of the team. I find all that stuff just really, really fascinating. Yeah. I'll get on it. We'll, we'll lock it in. Go Hills. Go Hills. All right, man. We'll see you soon. Like, and subscribe everybody. If you're still around. <laughs>